first and foremost, uh, you know, thank you everybody for joining in uh, today's, today's session. Uh, and thank you, uh, Surya and Shilpi and Smita and the whole LND Global team for, uh, you know, the opportunity to connect on uh, and share some of my learnings through, um, through uh, you know, uh, my experience at work and otherwise, and how can one deal uh, with the VUCA situation. Uh, so I'm sharing bit by bit as we go along the slide, and I think I'm changing this uh, in a way where you'd actually be able to look at um, uh, a slide which earlier had uh, effects, but now you'll just see up here one by one. So to set the context straight for all of us to understand, for those of whom have heard the word VUCA for the first time, uh, it's essentially a word coined uh, and used largely by the U.S. military uh, in the early World War days. To describe a situation which was highly volatile. You see the visual on, on your screen, which says how things could go topsy-turvy very soon. Um, uncertainty, which basically means a lot of questions, not too many answers. Um, a lot of complexity, which means a lot of things can link with each other. And a lot of ambiguity, which basically means you don't know what those next steps could basically be. Uh, and, you know, while there have been multiple other situations and you may have heard the topic VUCA a lot of times earlier, you know, you had the Y2K change, you had multiple other transitions coming in. But I think in my experience, there could not have been a more VUCA situation than the one that we are actually at this point, uh, you know, facing. Uh, a little bit about uh, what we would... At times at this point. Learning and development professional, um, you know, what would you have used your experience? You know, with your participants in, in session. So, you know, have we actually asked this to ourselves? The third part would deal with, uh, you know, looking at some of the more medium term things that we could do. Uh, have you looked at perhaps understanding yourself a little bit? You know, have you looked at uh, changes that could happen? Uh, and then essentially uh, for us to be able to look at a slightly more longer term uh, view. Have you aligned your life to your Ikigai? I'll perhaps help you look at what this term is as well as we go along. And right until the end, we would look at, uh, you know, the questions that you may have and, and answer that perhaps I could share with you as we go along. In the interim, if you would have any questions, I would recommend that you could actually uh, punch those in into the chat window uh, and the team would help me put this together and towards the end, we'll try and answer the questions. Uh, some housekeeping rules, you could make notes if you would, uh, if there are certain things that you would have heard for the first time, if you haven't known uh, some things. For those of us who we have met probably earlier, uh, it's a little different this time. We don't, it's a very limited time, not really a training session. Uh, and it'd be a lot more one way than perhaps two ways that you may have been used to, uh, you know, uh, connecting with me. Uh, so make notes wherever you think that's relevant. If you have any questions, type them in the chat window. Uh, and in case if there are any questions, we will deal with them uh, right until the end. Uh, a little bit about myself for those of you uh, where we haven't met. My name is Rohan Nabar with about 15 plus years of global experience in corporate and, and L&D consulting. I started my career uh, with uh, one of India's top most HR consulting firms, MAHR, which was eventually taken over by Radharanstad Group. Uh, spent some time with the Larson and Trubro Infotech leadership development team. Uh, was heading learning and development for Thomas in India. Uh, and my last professional assignments uh, were first heading learning and development for Zeiss in India, and then heading learning and development for uh, Zeiss in Asia Pacific. Uh, a little bit to do with uh, the certifications. Uh, I'm certified PPA practitioner to use the DISC tool for Thomas, uh, a certified TEIQ practitioner, which is to use the emotional intelligence tool for Thomas, uh, a certified professional behavioral analyst. Uh, I spent some time uh, uh, building competence on design thinking, and I'm certified on the IBM Enterprise Design Thinking as a practitioner and as a co-creator. I've also spent some time um, on, on building competence in, in an area called happiness. So a certified happiness coach by the Berkeley Institute of Wellness. And more recently, uh, there's an acknowledgement of work that I've done by the World HRD Congress um, by uh, acknowledging uh, me through uh, an award called 101 Most Fabulous Global Training Development Leaders. Now, this is not really just to set context or say too many things, but it is to say that anybody uh, who may have learned or experienced anything that they would 
would still perhaps face a lot of disruptions. And I have faced some of mine. I've helped a lot of people work through their disruptions. And that's with that experience, I'm here to share a little bit about what one could do in times we are here at the moment. Uh, some of you may have heard of this gentleman, Adam Grant, uh, and uh, he shares a lot of insights uh, from the world of psychology, from the world of work. Uh, a lot of it light-hearted and a lot of it very serious. So one thing that I uh, saw him share a couple of days ago in terms of perhaps the world's largest work-from-home experiment, he makes everything into two-by-two two matrices, right? So you see here uh, things that I have, uh, things that I don't have on one of the axes, and things that I need and things that I don't need. Uh, you see on, 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 the, on the first quadrant there, uh, Wi-Fi, a couch, coffee, doesn't matter where you are. Uh, things that I don't have, are things that I need, any sort of work ethic. I mean, if you are perhaps at home in an office. Things that I don't need and things that I have, any unrivaled ability to procrastinate. So we're probably not in our normal workspaces, not uh, at, at desks. Perhaps things that I don't need on the lighter way and, and I don't have pants on, right? So... Uh, you're probably in, in, in this situation at this point. Uh, what's happening a little bit uh, these days um, with regards to the COVID situation, specific impacts on the business and then the impact on l &D. So I'm going to actually uh, take you through the first piece now. Uh, looks a little different here. There was a one uh, sort of a caption and to my screen, it's not visible now. So, uh, you know, just to take you through it. As of uh, midday today, Indian Standard Time, this was basically what the number looked like. We had 1.3 million cases of uh, the coronavirus or the novel COVID-19. Uh, we've had about 74,000, close to 75,000 deaths across the globe already. Um, I didn't really want to start on as grim a note, but what I wanted to tell you is clearly these are situations we have never faced earlier. It's an unprecedented situation across the globe. BCP or business continuity plan until now was, if one geography gets affected, the other geographies take over and do the work that they're supposed to do. Uh, unfortunately, we've gotten to a situation where perhaps every country that exists in the world has at least one coronavirus positive case. And that's how significant this situation is. Now, uh, make no mistake, uh, you know, however the, the countries may be handling this, every country is impacted. Uh, if some of you have been following, for those who uh, have joined us from India and perhaps across the globe, uh, the Indian Prime Minister in his first speech talking about the coronavirus said that this is perhaps a situation with World War I and World War II put together, right? So that's how serious it is. Uh, has it all countries with severe impact, whether it's developed countries, developing countries, uh, and until there is actually a vaccine device, social distancing is the only strategy. We can only make sure that people are not, uh, you know, contracting the virus. That's the best that we can do at this point. If you've looked around a little bit uh, of communication, you would see that Arne Sorensen, who is the head of Marriott International, he actually put out a communication on March of 19th, which said some very, very strong uh, data points. Uh, business for Marriott back then, we are in April already, and this is a uh, word put on March 19th. Business was down to 10% as compared to this time last year. Significant dip. Uh, this is a hit more than 9-11 and the 2008 uh, financial crisis put together. It's huge. And not even sure when this is actually going to end. So the impact is not just where it is now, it's probably going to be larger. So I want you to understand Whichever industry you are from, uh, whichever function you are from, whichever geography you are from, this is clearly a situation that has never been seen. I wanted to start with this to set context. Whatever I would share with you from here on is not assuming that you have not been impacted by this, right? Each and every one of us has been impacted in some way or the other. A large part of our audience today are the LD community. So you are either responsible for L&D in your own organizations, you're running an L&D organization, or you are perhaps also um, you know, an L&D consultant. So working with multiple other L&D consulting organizations. So irrespective of where you, know, you are, this is a situation that has definitely impacted you. So this is the context in which I'd like to share some of my experiences of how and what we could do as we go along. Uh, and if you look at the, the slightly uh, you know, uh, uh, specific uh, area, which is the 
learning and development space, I'd like all of us to look at, uh, you know, McKinsey has uh, already put out a report about um, how uh, new workplace learning practices are coming about. The same uh, with Deloitte. Uh, you have uh, Coursera putting up uh, some information saying how learning courses that they have hosted uh, are available for free at this given point in time. Some collection of courses, that is. Uh, and since a lot of the schools, perhaps pretty much all schools across the world, have stopped classes or contact classes, there's material available by what, what we call as uh, COL, which is actually uh, uh, you know, uh, putting some of the school content available for individuals across the globe. So you know, one of the things I wanted to share with you is irrespective of your context in learning and development, when you go back to work, things are going to be very different. Things already are very different at this point. Uh, how do you deliver your sessions? How do you connect with your end client? Um, you know, how does the process of discussing needs I think all of this is going to undergo a huge amount of change. Are you ready to work around that change? Is a question that all of us need to ask ourselves. Uh, I'd like to work you through the second part of this, which is how can we work on this in the immediate or the short term with a few tools? And LD professionals, I think, across the globe, uh, we are actually used to putting our trainees on, or participants on the spot and tell them. Perhaps uh, if you, know, you were to go through a, a certain set of exercises, can you reflect on what you would do and how would you do things differently? And I've found quotes to be very powerful. I've found certain other exercises uh, to be uh, you know, useful. And I'm, the first seven days that I actually faced a situation, I asked these to myself. And I've actually collected them to share with you at this point. Uh, some powerful quotes. And some of you who've heard of Adam Grant, I mentioned him a little earlier. And Sheryl Sandberg, who is the chief operating officer of Facebook, uh, they've written books independently and they've written a book uh, together as well called Option B. This was when Sheryl Sandberg lost her husband uh, very, very unexpectedly at a vacation. Uh, she was distraught, very, uh, found it very difficult to get her life back on track. Uh, and on one of those situations, um, um, so Sheryl Sandberg's husband, just to give context, uh, collapsed on the... Uh, it is said is collapsed on a on, uh, uh, treadmill while exercising. Uh, and she found it obviously extremely difficult to, to deal with this particular fact. And one of the, uh, the questions that Grant asked her, uh, you know, uh, in one of their conversations is, you should actually think about how worse it could be than uh, that it has been. And of course, he didn't mean it negatively, but he mean, meant to say, what if that, uh, you know, her husband was at the wheel and with the kids in the car, and that's when he had uh, the stroke, essentially. So, you know, uh, how, how much worse it could have been. And so the fact that she's alive, the kids are alive, and she needs to make sure that life has to move on. I'd like to use this particular example to look at um, you know, the situation at this point. While the world's been hit, health has been hit around the world, and the economies have been hit, I'd like all of us to look at ourselves and see how we're still blessed to be here. Um, and that, from my perspective, is... Uh, a view that things could be worse, but you're still around. Uh, I found the locus of control as a very, very important tool. For those of you who may not have heard of this, let me quickly share this with you. Uh, you know, when you reflect on whether you are responsible for what happens in your life, or perhaps events externally control what happens to you. So whether you win or lose, is this in your control or is in the control of uh, situations and environment which is outside of your control? That's the question to ask. Uh, you'd realize that not everything is in your control, but by and large, if you shift your way of looking at things, your world can actually change. Uh, and if you look at the right side, you see uh, the popular circle of concern and circle of influence that Stephen Covey uh, popularized in his book, Seven Habits, which says the outermost uh, dark blue circle talks about things that you're worried about or that you're concerned about. And the lighter circle in the center, which is the things that you can influence or you can impact. Now, if you look at uh, a way to, to perhaps make sure that you are uh, in control of your life or as much as you can, how can you increase the light blue circle at the center versus perhaps you know, not shrinking this down? Now, the important thing to think about here is that we are not obsessed with getting everything under control, right? Uh, it is about as much as you can. Can you actually stop the pandemic from where you're sitting today? You cannot. 
Can you perhaps, uh, uh, you know, uh, get certain uh, steps for the government to change economic policies? No, you cannot. But what can you do in your particular control? How can you impact what's happening in your day to day life? How do you spend your day? How do you support your family when you're locked in? Uh, how do you help connect some of your clients and, and help them work through this uh, without stepping out of your home? That's the question to ask. Uh, and even though the situation is what it is, how can you make the best of it? To be honest, uh, I may not have an answer for everybody in your own situation, but this is a question that I'd like all of you to ask yourselves. And the third tool uh, I found very useful here and now, for those of you who may have read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Uh, very clearly, uh, there, to, to set context to those who may not have read this, uh, there are four characters, two humans and two little mice. The humans are hem and haw, for obvious reasons named like that. Uh, and then there are two, which is, uh, if you look at uh, Sniff and Scurry, which are two mice. Now it is that these four are, are stuck in a maze of cheese. And hem and haw don't realize that cheese in, in the place that they are searching is slowly getting lesser and lesser and lesser. And Hem and Haw are aware this is happening, so they're looking for other cheese already. Uh, to actually make sense of this in the context today, uh, all of us who've probably seen learning and development evolve over the last two decades, a decade and a half, you will see that changes had been happening already. Uh, if you pause here for a moment and look at this from the perspective of learning and development, you would say, hey, when things get back to normal, and if at all they will, the normal that it was earlier, uh, how is it going to be? Uh, am I going to have a job or not? Am I going to have a client or not? I'm going to have work or not? Uh, I'd like you to again shift your lens to look at. Uh, of course, there would probably be more opportunity uh, in the space uh, that you would probably look at, but you need to look at it differently. Uh, a quote from the same book that helps me look at things is, what you are afraid of is never as bad as you imagine it to be. The fear you let build up in your mind is worse than the situation that actually uh, exists. So if you were to look at, uh, and I can give you a little bit of my example, uh, when you look at uh, the individual um, uh, you know, or, or organizations which are looking at enterprise solutions, you may have had a bit of a pause or a reduction, but are you working with individuals? Are you working with one-on-ones? And I think a lot of people have this time to reflect um, and, and, and work on their lives. This is a good opportunity for all of us in the L&D space to be able to see what would you actually offer as you go along. Now, if you looked at what I shared with you until now, I see that there are, there are a few questions that may have come about and I think we'll, uh, we'll take them as we get through uh, uh, the whole deck. But at this point, I'd like you to share with you that this is basically just here and now, right? So what can you do as you would deal with the situation today? I'd like to take you through the next chunk, which is basically medium term. How can you learn or work through life medium term through some tools? You know, have you experienced self-awareness tools like the Enneagram, like the DISC? Uh, have you looked at, you know, what is your Ikigai? Uh, have you looked at, you know, uh, how can things be when you, when you look at, um, you know, reworking your life as we get out of the situation? Uh, a very, very strong tool I have been using the DISC for, uh, about 12 or 13 years now. Uh, and I think it's actually helped me look at how I've evolved as a person over the last 11 years. Uh, I realized while I was doing a session last September with a group when I actually, for the first time, put my DISC graphs over the last 11 years and I see how I have changed. And when I look back at it, I realized why those changes may have happened. You know, uh, starting at the bottom of the ladder, eventually to handle multiple projects, to eventually handling learning and development across a region uh, of course, unless you have changed, you won't really be able to handle things quite well. And, you know, Enneagram actually helps you look at, uh, you know, some of the things that you do more often, some of the things that you do habitually. And if you dig deeper, you'll start to understand what your strengths are, what your challenges are, and things that you can actually work on as you go along. Now, if you haven't yet taken the time to do this uh, in the last one year, some of you as, as uh, learning and development professionals, would be doing this for your customers. You're doing this for uh, coaches. You're doing this for your participants and trainees. But have you done this for yourself at least in the last one year? Do you do, you do this uh, perhaps more recurrently? If you don't, I recommend this is a good time to go down this lane, reflect, think through what are some of your challenges, what are your uh, personal strengths. Uh, I shared with you a little bit about uh, you know uh, working on design thinking. 
Uh, what's helped me when I look at this is, of course, I wouldn't go into the details of design thinking overall as we look at this, but the mindsets of a designer, right? Uh, are we actually empathetic towards situations around us? Are we empathetic towards the family members? Are we empathetic towards our colleagues? Are we empathetic towards uh, the essential commodities and people who are working on them? Uh, picture look very grim. I started this particular session talking about how difficult the times are. But unless we look at things a lot more optimistically, when things ease out, I think we may probably be down under and may not even be ready to pick up from there. Clearly, embracing ambiguity is one of the design thinking mindsets. If you don't hold this, chances are that you're perhaps worried about every small thing. We've been discussing uh, uh, you know, what to put out to the LND community perhaps uh, the last week and a half. And here you have the last week, uh, already you've had some of the uh, Mumbai colleagues share some of their insights. We have the Bangalore team start sharing today and you'll have uh, in, in the days to come. So clearly, if you do not embrace uh, uh, ambiguity and you do not make it, you will end up perhaps you know, just uh, 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 going around in circles and probably only looking at theories and not actioning it. Uh, do you learn from failure? Uh, design thinking encourages you to learn often and learn early. Uh, and, and of course, fail often and fail early and not, of course, fail towards the end. Uh, working on iterating um, things. So nothing's final. There's always an next version coming on. Uh, and, you know, while you're creative, you may perhaps have a lot of people challenge what you're saying and doing. So do you have the creative confidence to be able to work with what you're thinking? I find this very, very useful as uh, mindsets to look at life, not just design thinking as a process of working on a product. Uh, very, very useful. And, and the third part, I think, very, very important for us to look at uh, is how do you uh, look at happiness? I've been studying the subject of subjective well-being or happiness as it's called over the last six or seven years. And this image was doing the rounds of social media, uh, perhaps at the beginning of the lockdown. You know, if you cannot go outside, can you go inside? Uh, I spoke about some of the tools uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, if you have not actually been spending time with yourself, this is the time to do that. Uh, quite frankly, one line which encompasses this, some of you who are feeling restless to go out uh, and wander uh, you know, around, if you haven't had inner peace, happiness lies within and not outside. So don't chase what's there on the outside. See if you're uh, comfortable with who you are. See if you're comfortable with being locked in. Uh, if, you, if you actually make the most of this opportunity versus look at this as something that is binding you, right? So I wanted to make sure we did the first chunk, which was here and now. Uh, just to recap, we did the second chunk now, which is in the intermediate, which is what can you do in, in the, in the midterm. I'd like to now take you through the larger part of this, which is have you been able to look at aligning your life uh, with your Ikigai, right? Uh, some of you may not have heard of this term. I'll quickly walk you through this as we go along. The first step here is work to build your career versus a job. Uh, understanding, you know, design thinking and, uh, you know, going through things a little bit in detail. Uh, when you look at, uh, you know, looking at a career versus a job, uh, uh, something when you look at a job is, is about doing what you're asked to do, right? So this may probably not be in congruence to your values. But when you're looking at building a career, it is about doing what you value and which are aligning to your values. When you look at a job here, it is perhaps carrying a huge burden. When you look at it as a career, you know, how can you grow? How can you go up the ladder? I must confess here uh, to clarify when I say career and job here, I do not mean entrepreneurship and, and a full-time job, but it's just probably about how do you look at your work, even if it is a job? Do you look at it as something that you are tied with or do you look at something that you can build over, right? And the last part um, uh, is, is perhaps if you look at uh, it's tying you or is it actually, you know, a, a rocket uh, and then taking you to places. And more importantly, do you leave work being angry or do you leave work being happy? Uh, you know, I read a little bit uh, over the last some time in terms of are you stuck in, in, in a situation? Are you stuck in a job? Are you looking for your next job? I think if you are in a situation, a situation of this sort, a good thing to do would to take a step back and look at what can you do with the strengths that you have to build a career. If you are a learning and development professional uh, and you are in an organization, can you do beyond what you're doing at the moment? Can you contribute towards what the business uh, you know, uh, can get? Can you perhaps uh, do more than that's required for you in terms of designing and delivering? 
Uh, can you perhaps make sure that you're partnering with business, actually visiting customers? If you are an L&D consultant, can you perhaps um, uh, you know, dig deeper when a client asks you uh, to, to give a learning offering, whether learning is even a solution to it, right? If you are actually running a learning and development business, it's about you to look at whether you are actually helping your team members grow um, when they join you versus when they build a career. Uh, are they finding value in themselves or are they feeling that they're just doing mundane tasks? So, you know, in all of our circumstances and situations, it could be different things that could be uh, building, uh, a, uh, you know, uh, a career versus actually having a job. Uh, I found over a period of time, uh, the more you give, uh, the more you feel happy. In our community here where I stay, uh, we've made sure all of us as volunteers have collected some funds. Uh, and some of the essential folks who serve us here as the security staff, the housekeeping staff, we have made sure that we have uh, you know, given them um, some things to acknowledge uh, the, the fact that they are serving us even through this difficult time. Uh, look at an opportunity where you can actually give. If you operate from the perspective of giving versus getting, I think you should actually be able to see a lot more happiness coming in automatically. And the last part uh, I'm going to talk about is essentially have you found uh, what we, they call in Japanese your reason to live or your reason to be, which is called as Ikigai? Uh, there are four uh, circles here, if you look at it uh, from a geometric perspective, which have intersections. Uh, the right uh, extreme looks at what is it that the world actually needs? Uh, uh, you know, on the yellow top, you see what is it that you love? What are you good at? And what would you get paid for? And when you look at the intersection of all of these four and at the center, the dark green part there, is basically what is your reason for being or your ikigai. What this means is when you're able to actually work through what comes to you most naturally, convert this into something which gives people a lot more value. At the same time, of course, when they see value, they pay for what you do. Uh, this is not as simple as it looks like. You know, you need to reflect a lot. You need to think a lot. If some of you, if this uh, strikes a chord, uh, while we may not have too much of time to discuss this over this session, but reach out to me. Uh, you know, on a one-on-one, -on -one, and I think we'll explore this for you as individuals. Uh, I must uh, admit and confess this, that I found my ikigai and my reason for being in helping people live their lives better. And that's why I am here where I am. Uh, what, do I love doing that? Absolutely, yes. Uh, am I good at that? I think we should ask people who I've worked with over the years. Uh, do I get paid for it? For sure. And is this going to impact uh, the world? I think it will. And perhaps going forward, uh, a lot more. Um, what I would say is if you spend some time in this particular lockdown, and that's why I'm important to share this in the lockdown series, you'll be able to look at how much more you can do if you go within, understand what your strong points are and work through that. Uh, that's basically what I had to share with you. Uh, I'd like to quickly recap what we have gone through over the last um, few minutes. Uh, we first looked at uh, the fact that there, you know, what's happening in the situation at this given point in time in the world. Uh, we looked at a few things that you can do short term. You can do some things medium term, uh, and perhaps more long term. How do you align your life to your ikigai or your reason to be? Um, there may have been a few things that we have perhaps worked through uh, or skimmed through quickly. Uh, it would be good if any one of you have questions uh, that we could actually deal with them uh, at the moment. Uh, I'm actually doing this over my handphone, so I'm just trying to check with my team. Uh, if I should go to the chats myself, uh, or if one of you could help me, um, you know, as I'm sharing my screen, to read out some of the questions. Roman, I can read out the first question. Sure. Perfect. Go ahead. So the first question is, uh, just give me a second. Sure. Um, what could be more VUCA? So is VUCA anything that is un unexpected? This is from Ajay Chaudhary. Sure, go ahead. Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch the question. Could you what could be more VUCA? Is VUCA anything that is unexpected? Uh, so technically, uh, you know, this term was coined to be able to explain that there's a lot of complexity in one go. When you look at things that are complex, like I said earlier, business continuity plan was about saying if one geography gets uh, you know, in some ways uh, hit how the other geographies take over. 
Uh, but VUCA technically was used to describe when there are multiple complexities in, in, in them. Uh, I'm not sure whether there has been anything more VUCA than that we're facing at the moment. Uh, but I think uh, there, I'm just hoping that no other situations of this sort um, are faced by us in our lifetime. To answer your question in short, uh, can there be something more uh, VUCA than this? I'm not sure. I hope not. So is VUCA anything that is unexpected was the second part of the question. Um, so, you know, if you look at uh, something that is unexpected, there is one dimension to it, right? Um, and so it may or may not be fair to, uh, to actually term anything that's unexpected as VUCA. But if you look at it, there are multiple dimensions to this. Uh, VUCA is basically just a, a term used a lot more to look at something that is a lot more complex. So to answer your question, uh, you know, it's a thin line. You can perhaps take anything uh, uh, that would be uncertain, but more dimensions. Thanks, Ajay. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Rohan. Thanks, Ajay. So I'll read the next question from sure. Pratima. Uh, sure. When we come out of this situation, do you see the LND environment going back to classroom sessions as it used to be, or will the online platform be a more preferred mode of learning? I think this is a question all of us have, but yeah, right. go ahead, Rohan. Sure. So I think, uh, I think one of the ways, again, to look at this a little differently, because when we say classroom and when we say uh, digital, I think uh, a lot of organizations were already using uh, a lot of what, uh, you know, we would call digital. And digital is not really, uh, you know, sharing a screen or a video. It's also how interactive it is, um, you know, how uh, sustainable it is. So multiple sessions in one. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think what would be uh, important to look at uh, there are some topics which I guess at some point in time, it would be very, very, uh, uh, you know, you can't lose uh, on, on the face-to-face -face touch. So I think we will have a lot of uh, these, uh, the face-to-face -face sessions still happening. What would be interesting to look at uh, as we go along is the content of, of learning that, uh, you know, is looked at. Uh, I mean, if you actually do look around some of the, uh, uh, you know, the news even today, Shell, for example, I read about a day ago, is, is looking at getting all of its employees uh, to work through, you know, what digital is. I read about Deloitte doing that about uh, seven or eight months ago. So essentially, uh, you know, you would see that uh, the content of what you do would be more important than the way it is dealt with. Um, so I will see that as a primary sort of focus. But I guess there will there will be a lot more organizations exploring uh, the digital space for sure. Okay, Pratima and Rohan, and Rohan, thanks. So let me go to the next question. I think this question is kind of connected to the one that you were saying, or maybe you've already answered it. When is the situation expected to change? Right. So I think, uh, again, uh, there are two things to look at here. One is when we say change and when we say normal. Um, you know, uh, you would have heard a lot of people saying about what's the new normal. I think if you, if you look at it a lot more practically, uh, things would actually change. You know, we began this particular period uh, you know, with images of uh, uh, Prince Charles, you know, who was uh, using a namaste versus a handshake, right? You'll probably have very few, uh, uh, you know, large gatherings happening. Um, you will probably see uh, only and only when travel is required that people will travel and get more effective using digital tools. For example, in my last assignment, I was working on, on a global team and we had people from across countries, across time zones, and we were using, let's say, Microsoft Teams, we were using multiple other tools already. Uh, so there will probably be a lot more of uh, those being used. Uh, will there be uh, losses of jobs? I'm afraid, uh, you know, that, that there could be a possibility, a reality, uh, because it's just that that's how the economy works, you know. Uh, do you have organizations that may sustain? Uh, the longer this lockdown is, the more difficult it will be for organizations and, and countries to, to take this on. Uh, so, you know, I think there will actually be a new normal, uh, however cliche it sounds. Uh, and will we actually be the same? Perhaps not. Okay. Okay. So, shall I go to the next question? Sure. So, this question is from Madhavan. Uh, Hi, Rohan. Don't you feel that online routes removes emotional online routes? Not on. Yeah, online route removes the emotional connect between the trainer and the learner. How do you do behavioral training on a digital platform? Sure. So I think um, I'm absolutely with you on this. Uh, you know, when there is uh, actually a face-to-face -to -face, uh, touch, uh, you know, you can actually work around things very differently. 
we have participants coming into the class before the session starts. You get to do some small talk with them. Uh, you get to talk to them after the session finishes. Uh, you get to read their nonverbal cues clearly. You know, it, it, you can you can do that um, uh, additional than what you would actually give content to them. Uh, but I think what's important actually to look at as we go along is uh, you know the effectiveness and efficiency bit. So you know versus not having a training session and having a digital training session, you know, which is a better option. Um, so that's that probably will answer the question, uh, you know, depending on whatever topics you would look at. And over a period of time, I think, uh, you know, the way one facilitates sessions over, um, uh, you know, digital modes would change. For example, if you look at Zoom, it allows you to break out rooms. Uh, it allows you, uh, uh, you know, to do things that you would actually do in a face-to-face -face session. Uh, so, you know, as facilitators, as L&D professionals, we'll have to equip ourselves uh, to deal with some of these things differently. Can the, uh, can the emotional connect just to answer your question be exactly the same as it is in the face-to-face -face session? Perhaps not. Uh, but I think over a period of time, the more we get comfortable with this as facilitators and participants get comfortable with this as attendees, I think, you know, we will still get back to this uh, uh, much better because work will start to happen a lot more remotely. It's not just training, but people will be used to working remotely a lot more. Thanks. Thank you. So now I have the next question from Urmila. Uh, yeah. Urmila asks, how do we know that our digital seminars have been effective? So this is a question that I always wonder myself too in the recent times. So uh, if you could tell us, Rohan. Sure. So I think one of the important things here to note is, is not so much the mode uh, of training, uh, but about where the need comes from and, and how do you design the intervention. To give you a quick example, uh, you know, in, in probably a decade ago, you would have managers and business heads coming into you and say, I'd like to do a communication session. Or I'd like to do a session, let's say, uh, on teamwork, right? Now, if you as a professional would have dug deeper and tried to find out why they would want what they would want, you would be able to go through to the actual business issue and not just the behavioral or the, or the issue of skill. Um, if you would actually dig down that route and you figure what the actual need is, um, you would have structured what happens in the classroom and outside even earlier. So whether it is a digital mode or it is uh, the face-to-face -face mode, it's important what the individuals do outside of the session. So do you have a process to help people implement what they do? Do you have a process to make sure that this is in line with business results? This is in line with the culture of the organization. I think that would be important. Now, if it's done via digital, uh, you'd be surprised that actually it could be even, uh, you know, it could work to your advantage because you have more analytics about what people are you know, watching, when are they watching, how long are they watching it? Uh, are they actually interacting with the content? So you will actually start to realize that uh, if you use digital modes more uh, you know, often, you would realize that you are able to get this a lot more than the face-to-face -face session because you would still need a digital mode to be able to implement what you would have taught on a face-to-face. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that's answered Urmila's next question also. So our workshops will now be converted into seminars. Is that the way going forward? So I think what you explained quite uh, covered that question too. Sure. So, yep. uh, more of transparency is there uh, to SEMA to everyone. More of transparency is there. The authority is able to see person's actual ability, not much of chance for pretense. Okay. So that is, I think, based on that. Any any other questions? Uh, Rohan, do you want me to open it so that we can have a discussion here? Sure. What? Absolutely. I mean, if, if the questions that people have asked until now are done. Yeah, we are the... done with all the questions that people have asked until now. Okay, sure. so yeah, so uh, we can uh, open it. Uh, uh, we can, op I mean, the session is open for you all to ask any questions that you would want to to Rohan even on uh, voice need not be on the chat. So we have one more question on the chat, Rohan. Sure. I'll just read it out to you. Sure. How to ensure participants' attention, I guess, on online platforms like this? Sure. I think, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to actually uh, take up one of the previous questions and I think there's a continuity of that, you know, when you look at digital sessions versus face-to-face. -face. And when I said that the content is important, I think it's very, very important for us to look at, um, you know, as l &D professionals, how do we build a career? You know, uh, I, I began about 15 years ago doing just about everything that I could train on. And over a period of time, I've realized that there are areas where I'm very strong at and some things that probably, you know, I should not be doing. 
I think going ahead, how engaging you are in what you do, how deep you are in what you talk about would be very, very useful. So I think when you look at it from the perspective of, um, you know, how would things be going ahead? I think as professionals, if you choose one or two or at max, maybe three areas that you can actually uh, build competence or expertise in, I think that would be very helpful to be able to help people, uh, you know, going forward. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thank uh, you. Yeah. So any, any other questions, anyone? You can ask Rohan directly on voice also. If you, you can unmute yourselves. Could blended learning, wait. Could blended, this is from Anand Padmanabhan. Could blended right. learning and micro learning modules with gamification come in as the new norm in delivery? Uh, I, I must actually mention this, uh, that you know, uh, some organizations had been using this already. Uh, but I think it would have been a value add perhaps a couple of years ago. I think what may happen in my experience is that that would become just a, a basic requirement. Yes. So going forward. So all of you, uh, please put yourself in mute. Put, I, have un I have unmuted everyone. Please put yourself in mute because some people want to ask questions directly. So please put yourselves on mute. We want to accept the those who want to ask the question. So I'm going to mute everyone again in case you have. Muted as well, so you'll have to unmute me. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, Rohan, can you hear me now? Oh, I can hear you now. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, can you please go back to the last question because I think we lost you somewhere with yes. all the noise. Yes. I think uh, it is about whether... Uh, Blended learning and uh, micro learning modules. Correct. So, uh, you know, essentially maybe uh, a couple of years ago, uh, that would have been the new in thing, right? For example, can you gamify what I'm doing? Can you do something more digitally? And I think it's important uh, to know that that will probably be a benchmark now. So that would be a basic. When you actually go to talk to a client, when you actually go to your own business heads, they will say, can you do this? Because my guys now are actually on the uh, on the field and they probably can't sit in a classroom. So that'll be probably be a basic then really value add going ahead. Okay, so uh, this is the next question is from Kavita. She says, right. I'm an experiential facilitator. How can right. we do this digitally? Um, I think one of the one of the things that uh, we would we would, uh, you know, um, experience is uh, everybody has their own style of conducting a session and experiential largely uh, is to do with conducting an exercise, you know, uh, let people do certain things and then have them arrive at or observe their own observations and learning versus telling them what they need to learn, right? Uh, now, experiential uh, can in the face-to-face -face term mean a lot of things. It could actually mean, let's say, uh, something like uh, an outbound uh, program, for example. Well, it could mean that, you know, there, is a lot of, there are a lot of activities. Uh, I think what would happen as we go along is uh, we could maintain our style uh, with perhaps a lot more, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have experienced these, but a lot of digital simulations. Uh, and when you look at a simulation, it's very similar to what you would look at an outbound activity or an activity even inbound, uh, where a lot of people are playing it together. Uh, this, you know, they have to respond to a situation and all of them respond differently and there's a different output to this. And then you come back to the drawing board and say, you know, why did you do this and what do you see and what can you do differently? So I think, uh, you know, as facilitators, it's about time for us to probably pick up uh, what are the things we need to do to facilitate sessions digitally in an experiential manner. So can this be done? Answer is yes. Uh, are there tools available already? Absolutely, yes. Uh, it's about us picking them and exploring. Okay. Thanks, Rohan. Thanks, Kavita. There's a question from Madhavan here. Is there any free Enneagram tool online for self-assessment? I hope I pronounced that right. So I think there are uh, multiple uh, freely available tools, uh, you know, uh, over the internet. But I, you know, having worked with DIC extensively, so I headed the learning development for Thomas in India. 
for a while and worked through thousands of folks with their DICs and EIs. Um, and also the journey to Enneagram has, has begun. Uh, you know, quite frankly, a lot of the tools that are available for free don't necessarily give you a lot of deep insights and inputs. What would be useful, uh, you know, is to look at if you are sure of where and how you're going to use your report, right? It's worthwhile in investing in one of these uh, for, for, a, for a short period of time. So, for example, after today's session, if you realize that there are some specific things that, I mean, I'm just giving you questions. I'm not necessarily giving you answers throughout. But when you see a question for yourself and you want to dig deeper in that, uh, then it might be worthwhile in, in investing in one of these, perhaps once a year, once in two years, for us to actually develop. Because what you would get as an output in, in, in a paid tool would be far, far uh, more accurate, of course, uh, you know, would be far more detailed um, and would be more valuable versus, uh, I mean, it's hazardous to use a tool which is freely available uh, and can give you something very, very basic. Your understanding of interpretation of the report would be incorrect. Would, would that make sense? Thanks. Thanks, Madhavan. Thanks, Rohan. The next question is, um, how do we do activities, energizers and games in digital sessions? Um, in Zoom, I have, we, we can, I mean, I've done it too, but Rohan, please, right. if you can tell us about this. Right. So, you know, I think when this, when this lockdown actually happened, uh, one of the first communications to me came from my son's school, my older one's school. Uh, and it was beautifully titled. It says that, you know, school stops, but learning continues. Uh, and they basically had their, uh, in, in about a week's time, they had uh, asynchronous learning sessions already for the kids. Uh, which included, uh, you know, physical activity, physical, uh, you know, uh, ability, uh, music, etc. Now, uh, can some of this actually be done as effectively as Facebook? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. Uh, but if you look at it from the perspective of using the Zoom video and sharing both videos, uh, there could be some uh, stuff that you could. The only thing you may miss, however, in a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 let's say. Uh, icebreakers you would use uh, earlier is where you in one interacts with the other. And that's the one thing that I think digitally may be challenging. Um, you could still do multiple of those digitally where you have people connect to anybody that they want uh, and get some insights about themselves. So they may physically not be energized, but mentally they could still be triggered. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Rohan Udmila. Any specific webinar tool for effective video training other than uh, Zoom? Other than Zoom. I think in, in my, uh, uh, you know, days uh, with organizations, I think we've used, of course, uh, WebEx uh, extern, uh, you know, extensively. I think Zoom is really uh, a tool more popular now because of how it's, uh, you know, it's open way of working and I think user friendliness. Uh, on a one-on-one, on -on -one, I think what could also work on maybe one to very few people, I think also Google Hangouts could work. Uh, quite honestly, um, you know, in my, so I'm also kind of a little bit of newbie in this uh, space. So I'm undergoing my learning as well. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, I may not have uh, too many recommendations to make. Yeah, Zoom, I think has worked really well so far. And even with activities and, you know, other things uh, that other questions they've asked, you can use breakout rooms and do various activities also on Zoom. It worked really well. I have found it to be really good. What tools would you recommend? This is a question from Raj. I think it's connected to, uh, he, he says, I mean, firms or products. Right. Uh, I'm assuming that there could be two kinds of tools you could be talking about. Um, and this could probably be uh, about the behavioral tools that we would have, we would have spoken. So that could be one and second could be actually tools to, uh, you know, have digital sessions of this sort. So uh, I'm not sure which of these two uh, they could be. I think I could answer both. So uh, I think the first tool, I think all tools are brilliant, right? Uh, I've used uh, the DIC for TTI. I've used the uh, DIC for Thomas and I'm oh, certified. Uh, so he says behavioral now. Correct. Correct. Right. So I think all of these tools are extremely valid. I've used a strengths finder for myself. So there are multiple tools, uh, MBTI, uh, that are available and all of them have their own merits. I think what's important is to look at where you're going to use these. If I, if I take a quick minute to, to, to dig, uh, dig deeper, each of them are measuring different things. So for example, if you look at a DISC, it's actually talking about behavior. So it's a lot more you know, superficial interaction of people that you may want to look at. And that can be observed and changed uh, you know, in, a, in a short term. 
if you look at something like an MBTI, which is a personality tool, it goes much deeper to the core and, and your personality can't really be, uh, uh, you know, changed overnight. It's technically something that you would groom somebody, let's say, for within senior level position. So you'll use this for a more longer term coaching or leadership kind of a situation. Uh, if you look at, let's say, there are a lot of uh, tools measuring learnability. Uh, you, you may probably use a lot of this uh, to, to look at whether you are picking people for a job which would need learnability. I think in times to come, that will be a basic, right? Uh, earlier, there used to be uh, something that's required for technology jobs because technology keeps changing over a period of time. But I think if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the situation now, learnability is going to be a skill everybody would need. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rohan. Rohan, now this one question, uh, Seema wants to ask you saying, working with children, Zoom is not safe. To teach children, what would you recommend? T uh, she means teenagers. Right. Um, I think, you know, quite honestly, what would be useful is to look at what, uh, you know, what age would you be looking at? I think you mentioned teenagers. Secondly, what topic are you trying to deal with? Because, you know, um, I think a lot of tools would have their own limitations. Uh, uh, and, and I'm assuming, you know, you may have observed some limitations for Zoom, which is why, you know, you kind of put this question. Uh, but in my view, uh, you know, one of the things is that uh, all of us are learning in that sense. Even if you've used Zoom before, uh, the scenario that has come about now, you may not have used this as extensively to, for sessions. You may use it for meetings and, you know, short chats. So I think it's about us being able to use this tool a lot more. Um, uh, you know, essentially when you're, when you're saying digital, it's actually getting into a space which is unknown to us anyways. So I think, uh, you know, using any tool can be equally dangerous at the same time, equally giving us opportunities. Okay. Uh, so to answer your question, is there another recommended tool at the moment? Uh, I'm afraid, you know, I'm, I would not be able to have a recommendation. So from pra Pradeep Padukona has this question. Do you have ROI info comparing digital learning and classroom facilitation? Right. So what happens with, with ROI on learning essentially is that the design of the learning has to be based on ROI first. So, for example, like I said, uh, I think a few minutes earlier, uh, business heads would come and say, I want a session on communication. I want a session on team building. I think if you've built an intervention with that need in mind, I think it's very difficult to work through the ROI. So it's important to look at where the need has come in. I mean, I, my popular example to share is, let's say a business head comes in and says that their margins are going lower. And, you know, digging deeper, figure that you know, their people are not being able to negotiate well. And what do they need Sir, to do? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Rohan. He's particularly asking you about feedback scores. Ah, so which is which is level one and level two, which is, yeah, yeah. So I think, um, you know, technically uh, level one, which is feedback, I think uh, will just need to be more user friendly. I think uh, level one feedback captures, you know, how uh, learners have felt through the session. So it's important to look at uh, how comfortable they are with what is happening. Um, and then it probably depends a lot on the tool you're using. Uh, they, people could be using this, uh, you know, in, with very, very. So I think that would be, uh, ROI, I'm not sure. So ROI probably would be how much you're spending on the tool and whether it's effective. But technically, uh, you know, from a learning perspective, ROI would be that, you know, you have built a learning intervention and whether it has brought about a business impact. So from the shorter term perspective, I think possible. The longer term, maybe not at this point. And also, maybe we will get to know as we move on, being in Correct. this situation. Absolutely. Correct. Thanks. Correct. Thanks. So, how there's one more question from sure. JA. Uh, sure. How would we go about TNAs for digital platforms? Right. Uh, so, I think what would happen is uh, if, if you look at in the past, and some of the better organizations, you know, equipped from a learning perspective, have their learning experience system or, or learning management system connected to some of their other tools already. So, for example, uh, you know, they are connected to their productivity through Microsoft tools, let's say, for example, uh, you know, through Access, through Microsoft Teams, etc. In fact, in, in some of the sessions I've attended by the Microsoft team, it actually tells you how and who uh, is more productive, what are the networks that they have, uh, you know, in their, in their uh, team and who's connecting with who well. I think those are the kind of things, uh, if they're connected to your learning platform, uh, needs would start to come in a lot more, uh, you know, with artificial intelligence than actually trying to dig deep. Uh, you'll probably find a lot of data that you can mine later to be able to look at what needs come out without people actually telling you what they need. 
Uh, and I think that's very, very important, uh, a thing that you will get, which you may not have had earlier. Uh, can you also collect a lot more? Can you reach out to more people through surveys digitally? For sure. I mean, that's possible as well. So I think, uh, you know, going ahead digitally, uh, the learning needs analysis can be far uh, broad reaching, far deeper. And I think a lot more data driven than it could have been in the past. Thanks. Thanks, Rohan. Thanks, Pradeep. Uh, we ha I have one more question from Anand Padmanabhan. Could you mention any tools to assess learnability in specific to non-technical roles? So, uh, uh, one of the tools that I had used extensively, um, you know, when I was heading learning for Thomas and even after that, uh, as, as a customer of Thomas, as I, it's a very, very popular tool called GIA. Uh, and that really is able to help you look at, um, you know, your folks uh, through benchmarks, you know, uh, firstly, uh, where are the learnability scores and what kind of skills could they learn quicker and, and, and easily and what would they need more effort to learn. Uh, if you probably were to use tools like these, even to hire, you would start to realize where people would fit in better. What could be your uh, thresholds and benchmarks? Uh, who could you move from one kind of a function to another kind of function? Um, so there are tools like those. I've used GIA extensively. Uh, I'm sure there are multiple others available in the market as well. Okay, I think uh, we are done. Any more questions, anybody? We are at seven now. So if you have any questions, anybody, this is the time. Okay, I think we should be closing the session because we are at seven. Rohan? Uh, I'll just take so a minute if it's appropriate. Can, yeah, uh, it's up to, I mean, uh, the ball is in your court now. Please go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, um, you know, we've spent a lot of time already uh, getting uh, acquainted to things that we would be in for. If any one of you has any questions, want to dig deeper into any of the aspects, feel free to reach out to me via LinkedIn. Um, you know, you could probably reach out to me via uh, my email, which is rohan.d.nabar at gmail. Maybe I can put that on the chat window. Uh, feel free to ask me for any support that you would need. It is in my Ikigai to be able to help people live their lives better and more fruitfully. So uh, anything that I could do for that would be phenomenal. Thank you for the opportunity, Smitha. Thank you, Shilpi. Thanks, Surya, for this as well. And thanks for the team. Thank you so much, Rohan. Thanks, everybody, for the wonderful participation. We had a great session. Uh, thanks. Shilpi? So I think we can yes, sign off. Uh, yes, yeah, Mr. it was a fantastic session by Rohan. Thank you so much, Rohan. We've got My some amazing feedback. Thank you. And uh, great learning. Thank you. Yeah. Great learning. Thank you so much. Thank My you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. See you.